So today we will explore a little bit um, the Teragata, which is the the verses of the elders, <laughs> and um, I thought this this would be a uh, interesting to try and uh, have a good uh, Sangha Nuspati <laughs> or uh, do the um, recollection of the Sangha a little bit because I think one of these places where you can actually find more information about you know what really Sangha is and these uh, uh, uplifting uh, examples uh, are found in there actually mostly in the suttas we have a lot of the the discourses obviously this is what the <laughs> sutta means so but this is uh, it's a little bit off of it's not completely off but it's a little bit um, it's in the minor discourses so it's treated as a, a smaller kind of treaties of I guess the elders um, and I think it's quite it's quite good to uh, especially nowadays you know we don't have the the Buddha or <laughs> and so it's really nice to have um, s some people to look up to you know I, uh, it's hard to find sometimes and I'm not saying I'm a particularly good example. <laughs> so, um, but I can point the way to where we can find these really good examples. And I think it's really important. For me, it's important anyways to have people to look up to, to have people to raise me up kind of thing. The Buddha does a really fine job at that, I think, <laughs> for me anyways. But... Um but the Terras, you know, the, the Buddha sometimes it's it's tricky because he's the Buddha. So he's a bit like the big icon, you know, the big spiritual leader <laughs> and he's like he says things and in our Western minds sometimes it's hard sometimes to it, it causes problems sometimes but just because of the way it's said or the way it's not our usual we tend to be careful I think uh, to you know uh, when t somebody talks about their own qualities <laughs> so like the Buddha saying like oh yeah <laughs> just you know I, I that's just what I've noticed in my experience here it's that's not very popular <laughs> it's not a very popular thing in the west anyways or it takes quite a lo longer time for it to for people to feel more comfortable in opening up into this kind of 
I guess, this kind of, uh, of way of exposing themselves or the Buddha. But the Teras are quite, um, it's very interesting because it's different, because they're just the people who listen to the Buddha and they're his closest disciples, his closest students and followers. And it's really interesting to hear their testimonial, to hear, and it's really uplifting, I find. It gives, it really fills us up with a lot of strength and a lot of faith and you know that the right kind of faith the just the faith of understanding like well these are like quite powerful testimonials of the elders some of them declare you know f final knowledge some of them uh, explain how how grateful they uh, they they are to the buddha to to encounter this uh, or some and some some of them will also um, extol the Buddha. And now we have it's a different shift, and that's why it's so interesting because it's now it's not the Buddha saying it; <laughs> it's actually his disciples who are actually saying, "Yeah, he, it's like what an amazing thing." And like, because I mean, I say that all the time, but you know, there's so much I can say about it. <laughs> it's like. People will be like, well, yeah, sure, like you really like the Buddha, but <laughs> I'm not the only one. <laughs> so, so I guess <coughs> I'm calling on the elders today, <laughs> so that they can hella help us, raise us up, and um, and I will be reading from two different translations too. So these are not mine, obviously. Uh, I've translated very, very few, like few verses from them. Mainly those on joy, obviously. So, <laughs> but this is Tanisa Rubiku's, uh, and it's all you can all borrow them if if you want. It's, they're all here. They're all for you. <laughs> and the ter the Teragata from. Uh, K.R. Norman, which is the normal PTS. And I will change some words, sometimes like the word evil, <laughs> which, which I am not um, particularly fond of. I don't think, I don't think it has a very, I don't think it has a context in our, in our culture right now. But because um, they, they often say like evil qualities or something like that. It's just, you know, like hurtful unwholesome qualities that's yeah unskillful you know like akusala but it's papa or papaka mm -hmm. so yes that's kind of what it means but you know we're, we're I, I think we're not there anymore <laughs> so <laughs> um so just so you know i i am adapting a little bit as i go especially from the pts And we'll go through about some of them. I think uh, Tanisa Robiku does a very fine job at them. He's uh, he's quite uh, skilled, but he doesn't do um, he doesn't do all of them. And it, it's it's like a, um, it's really right up his uh, skill. You know, uh, Tanisa Robiku is is a bit of a you know poetic kind of writer. So the verses of the elders are like verses so they're they're said in that kind of form and he's a, he's he's good at it so um i mean we're there's there's quite a lot in there obviously we're we're just gonna like skim the surface and we're not I, i'm not gonna go it's just gonna be very simple I'm gonna just start from the beginning and the way that it's arranged is um there's the chapter of single verses then every Terra says one verse basically and then there's the chapter of two verses and there's the three verses and so we're, we're just gonna stay in the f one verse uh, and there's um, but even though and I think that's the power of it is like some of these just one verse is enough you know it's quite uh, 
the first words of the Buddha that I read was the Dharmapada. And for me, that was uh, uh, it was huge. And that's what made me, you know, like, that's what locked it in for me anyways. That's like, okay, I now, now I found it. Like, that's what I've been looking for all this time. And it's all one verse, you know, and I thought these, these one verses were so powerful. Uh, of course, we have like so, so many longer teachings that are really amazing also, but it's also nice to have these really, you know, these very punchy <laughs> kind of... <laughs> So I thought that would be an interesting uh, exercise today to do a little bit of a change from uh, last time was a three hour, maybe three hour and a half talk. So <laughs> today will be a little shorter. Um, and the first, the, the first of the elders who starts the, the whole proceedings is uh, Bhante Subhuti. And Subhuti is, um, well, I'm not really going to talk about him, but he's saying um, this is a bit a hymn, a bit of a hymn of, of the, the elders, where um, I believe it was the, the Buddha and the Sutta Nipata, another shorter collection, who's, who says that. It's a longer discourse. This is just one verse of it. But there is like a comparison with the, this, the happiness of the farmer and the happiness of the Buddha. And they, the farmer says one verse and the Buddha says another verse that is using his words but changing it to the happiness of his way of life and awakening that he found. And this is one of them. So he says, My hut is roofed, comfortable free of drafts, my mind well-centered, released. I remain, I remain ardent, so rain, Deva, go ahead and rain. <laughs> so this is um, very, uh, we find that verse quite a lot in the, in the suttas, in a little bit every few places. And it's um, it's really pointing to this um, this joy of you know there's nothing you know there's it's just <laughs> his his hut is roofed and that's all he needs and it's pouring rain and it doesn't matter because he's just well centered it's a storm outside but there's it's not affecting him so and uh, in Pali the rain is always said rain deva <laughs> because uh, for them it, it was uh, it's like a rain cloud like the rain clouds are like rain devas actually <laughs> so that's why it says that um, And this uh, well-centered is actually well, like this, it's samadhi. So this is an interesting um, approach to the, the usual concentration, I guess. So well-centered. Now the next is Maha Kutita. Calmed and restrained, humbled, unruffled. One shakes off unwholesome qualities as the breeze a leaf from a tree. And I also thought this was quite uh, seasonal. <laughs> um, and I think maybe I, I will read uh, that's this translation is Calm, quiet, speaking in moderation, not conceited. One shakes off un unwholesome qualities as the wi wind shakes off the leaves from the tree. Uh, 
and it's just a really wonderful exercise to just I think uh, contemplate these these sayings um, like a person that has these qualities what what is there to to stay or to, to cling to, you know, these, when there's uh, calmness and humility and um, speaking a little, there's not, you know, it's, it's, things just go by, you know, they're just, there's nothing to latch on to. Now, kanka, <laughs> isn't it? Yes. I think so too. I could just, yeah. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yes. Yes. It's, well, you know, it's letting go. It's another way of talking about letting go. It can, it just cannot stick. You just. Kanka, and now kanka, kanka means doubt. So it was uh, Kanka Kanka Ravata. That is the the doubter. He's he's known in the Vinaya for doubting a lot of what uh, other people would do or like their their um, uh, behavior as as monks. He's like uh, the doubter. So he would like ver be really strict on the Vinaya and things like that. Uh, but it's a. Uh, so now he's talking. He's talking a little bit about that here. How the Buddha see this, the discernment of the Tathagatas, like a fire ablaze in the night, giving light, giving eyes to those who come, subduing their doubt. So. Doubting Ravata got subdued his doubt by the Buddha, <laughs> and that was, uh, and that's another really powerful one. Whereas, to me, that that's really what I find about the Buddha's teaching is that it's really like a fire blazing in the night. Like, it makes things very clear. It's like in a place where there was no light before. You, like I know for myself, for sure, I wouldn't have figured it out on my own. Like I, I've had, I've, I read the Buddha's teaching and I studied it a lot and I practiced. And I was able to see and understand things that never would have I encountered by myself. Like never, like not even a chance, you know? <laughs> I've had... You know, I've had the good fortune to stumble upon his words, but, and, and to be interested and, you know, like to think that it makes sense and to be like, whoa, like this is amazing. But um, I'm also aware of, uh, of the night, you know, of how, how dark it can be. And before, um, I can remember parts of my life before I met that teaching and yeah, I can definitely relate to that. And so much gratitude. It's like, wow. It's like all these things I didn't understand and I didn't see before. And now it's, it seems like it's so clear. That's, that's the, which is the way it works. And this takes... Um, and it's not something that happens, you know, right away or something. It's really just as it goes it, it it just gets stronger and stronger and dabba this is dabba uh, the malian who is um, who is he was very young and he <laughs> he became an arahant very young and uh, i think he was like yeah so this is uh, this is dabba and dabba means capable in in pali Whoever, hard to tame, has been tamed by taming. Capable, contented, crossed over doubt, 
victorious as his fears are dispersed. He is capable. He is Dabba. Unbound, steadfast in mind. And often we have this kind of, um, we find this kind of rhetoric uh, in the, the canon where Arahants kind of describe their qualities and this is a bit um, <laughs> it's because it's so impersonal for them it's like this um, he's just like talking about his own name I guess <laughs> in, the, in a way that uh, it's hard because it's not we don't speak Pali and this is not like this is not it's meant to be Pali not English in the first place but his name is capable so he's just like <laughs> doing like a kind of a joke with his name kind of thing so it's just like yeah he, he's uh, but he was capable of taming himself and that's that's um, that's huge in the Buddhist teaching it's it's mainly um, The, the Buddha says that uh, in, in our mindset uh, in the Western world, it's like the word taming for, for us is not <laughs> it's, it's okay, but it's not the best. Um, but the Buddha talks about that a lot, like taming oneself. And he says it's the hardest taming, the hardest kind of taming to do, taming ourselves. And so th this Dabba, he's... Uh, and also in Pali, this is quite, you've probably noticed um, Asia, India a lot. Uh, they will say this, 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 like even talking about themselves or this, or they're like a friend. Oh, this, this Bhante, this, there's a lot of this. So that's why he's saying it. Uh, that's why he's saying this. <laughs> Yes. But maybe there's another reason for why it's obvious that it's because it's the most paradoxical. Yes. Right. Yes. Well, he he speaks of himself at the third person most of the time. And the pr the problem is that you know in our in our context, it's just that these things have been used in the wrong way too often. And people have become very careful about that. And uh, like I know for me, that's what it is. You know, that's that's what it was for me, anyways. And I know that I'm from a background like that. And I know I know very well what you know some people in my family th what they think and things like that. And and I understand. It's I actually do. But it's it's one of the challenges here in kind of passing this teaching through. Is that the way that it's um, said? It's just that it's been heard so many times before, and and it's been used for the wrong. So it has hurt people. There's been abuse. There's been all kinds of n not so great stuff. You know, like we hear about it a lot right now, actually, which is kind of sad. But in a way, I totally understand these people that are like really careful and kind of fed up with it you know <laughs> so, like who could blame them um, but the thing is that as if we take it really strictly as really how the Buddha saw it 
because it's really helpful actually to understand why he's talking like that because to him self doesn't exist like it, there's no such thing so for him this is just pointless this is like this these are facts that i say and that's it if like it's not necessarily like to him it's not boastful at all but um there is this kind of a uh, kind of flavor that comes out of the teaching sometimes that can be exactly like you said interpreted in that way and also to to people who really are knowledgeable and more and more of the teaching it's something that you will notice too as just as just being like oh no but that's just a fact and actually that's part of having an unshaken mind uh, having a mind that is really strong in the dhamma is actually knowing that these things are just facts they're just you know they're just things that you're maybe uh it's like this book is red i don't have you know whoever would come here and tell me that this book is blue i mean i don't know you know it's like it's just a fact i, I there's not there's no like um it's not like i'm attached to the book being read it's just like i just think that's what it is you know so that's just that's just what 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 the reality is about it so it becomes a very kind of a detached kind of uh, process of uh, of seeing things as they are <laughs> I guess now I'm not I'm not saying that I'm there at all I just want to be clear I'm <laughs> really not implying that I'm anywhere near that I'm just explaining something that that's just how I can see that but you know, I'm not saying that this is my case at all. And, oh yes. Just to make clear, I'm some, sometimes some things can be uh, <laughs> interpreted. So here there's a, there's a bit of a gap here in the ten, Bante Ten Cero, and I'll just fill it in. One should associate, this is Punna Mantaniputta. One should associate only with the good, the clever, those who see the goal, wise, vigilant, and discerning. They attain to the goal which is great, profound, hard to see, subtle, and fine. I'll read it again. <laughs> One should associate only with the good, the clever, those who see the goal, wise, vigilant, and discerning. They attain to the goal which is great, profound, hard to see, subtle, and fine. Well, again, pointing to Kalyana Mitata, the beautiful friendship. Um, and it's... Um, that this one also is, is quite so profound in a way that... Um, And that's another reason, I guess, why I wanted to read you this. You know, for, for me, uh, where I'm going is it's, it's great. Uh, there's a lot of Dhamma. <laughs> there's a lot of, like, Dhamma runs deep uh, in Sri Lanka. Even, you know, it's, it's very different also. But here is, um, here is different. Uh, it's hard to find. Dhamma is hard to find, and um, this uh, 
when we it's so funny when I I was thinking back of earlier when I well I wanted to be a monk for a while uh, but it's hard here because we don't we just don't know anything you know it's like oh this is like this is what I want I remember after my first m retreat and merit and I was like um well this is what i want to do <laughs> i was like what <laughs> but what now <laughs> like <laughs> now i have like now i'm going and then uh wh where am i supposed to go like what what am i supposed to do i didn't know like it took me two three years still and a lot of searching and a lot of trying to find you know where how does it even work and uh So this uh, this points to community, I think, too, where it's like um, it's so precious, like so very precious. Like when I went back home for, you know, a month, it was it was good to see my family, but it's different when there's uh, when there's not the Dhamma. It's like uh, I don't know, maybe you have a different outlook on it, but for me, it's uh, it's very different. It's very. Um, it's uh when the emphasis is all always on you know enjoying uh, pleasures of the senses and things like that I, I find it very heavy personally i i don't feel it i i feel it weighing down on me not uplifting me i always seek to uh always have a a, a touch of the dharma all the time you know where uh, where I can find uplifting words, uh, I can find um, the Buddha's the Buddha's discourses are they definitely do that. Um, they give you that thing that nobody can rip away from you, <laughs> that happiness that is very very strong, and. Uh, very unique it's not like um, when you invest in the Dhamma you can be sure it's gonna pay back <laughs> like, really and it's um, it's a safe investment because <laughs> yes <laughs> financial advisor <laughs> well <laughs> Dhamma advisor I guess <laughs> yes <laughs> yes <laughs> it's like when they I was saying uh, I was having a talk with someone is they saying about um, like how in economical sense you there is like a these things that these companies or who some people some places when you when you buy there they have like a better kind of uh, return to their communities or whatever I don't know how to say that or like a better kind of uh, like when you give to them you you actually like it's gonna help the economy kind of thing or whatever bloom <laughs> i said yes yes that's like that's that's it <laughs> that's exactly it but i forgot to say that i meant in the dharma <laughs> it's the same thing <laughs> but like in the dharma like if you put your chips on the dharma <laughs> then you can be sure <laughs> and that's again that's the qualities of the sangha the sangha and the sangha is not you know it's not just the robes you know it's it's the p is it's you is the community it's everybody that practices you know that's 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 the real sangha the buddha doesn't say oh oh uh, the oh the the uh, the practice of the awakened one sangha is straight is good and is wise and is you know meaningful just for those in robes no no he says the four kinds of people eight types of the, the eight types of individuals so those are the sangha and um, that sangha is extremely precious because that's where and that's what I've been trying to do here also is uh, you know get resources like get the 
discourses that, that actually people can read them and uh, that's really that's really low on the scale actually but like I mean the most important is definitely you know the people but that's kind of what I meant implicitly as that's why <laughs> that's because of the people that I do that but um, um, it's so precious and it's so rare like it's it's not uh, especially here in the West it's not like something you can just like go somewhere and expect to have you know a, a really good uh, uh, Dhamma discussion with someone you know <laughs> like how uplifting it is to just like cultivate wholesome states hmm <laughs> well maybe but <laughs> um, yeah so um, and that's why that's why I I also thought this would be good to you know just to share um, before I go because it's one of the places where you can have some company actually the suttas are good for uh, <laughs> right isn't it like I think that's well that's for me it is <laughs> monk's company <Yeah. laughs> and you'll see a little bit later we, we really also get to see like this deep love for solitude that these these elders had also you know we often you know these uh, the the monks they have they had these really small bubbles of you know they have one or two or three or four close disciples well disciples or followers or people in in our you know if if we look at monastic terms you have like the salmon eras and then you know so you, you have someone who shows you how to be a, a monk and things like that so but this gets to be the buddha says it's it should be like a father and son relationship or a mother and daughter relationship if it's on the side of nuns but that's the relationship it should be like and so uh so it's a very it's a very close bond and but usually they would move together you know to you know s somewhere in the forest or somewhere where they're supported and they would uh, usually try to be in solitude as much as they can and um, really uh, drink deep into this bliss of mental stillness and that that bliss from just this because when you're okay with this <laughs> when you're when you're when you're just when you're looking at the way the Buddha describes the four jhanas in the Samanya Palasutta the fruits of the truth seeking life like that joy welling up from within it pervades the whole body it immerses drench suffuses pervades the whole body each of the jhana is like that he gives similes even when when that is the source of your joy <laughs> of your happiness it's nobody can take that away from you or it's going to be really hard i mean if you were even if you were Even if you were put in jail, you'd be like, great, <laughs> awesome, <laughs> like really, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what's the best insurance, you know, this dhamma, <laughs> is that, and the more you learn to tap into that and really make that your, your stronghold, that's where you go to for your happiness, that's going to be for your welfare for a very long time and to but for this you also need the community around because I mean monks and lay people we we uh, we all in this together also so um, 
and community is a big it's huge i mean the the buddha the buddha says it very clearly why is friendship and to find to find people that are um that are supporting that is is quite is extremely precious This is Dabba. So yes, when uh, this uh, this Teragata can be your also good company <laughs> here. When I'm gone, you can read this. Balia, where was I? Okay, here. Balia. Who scatters the troops of the king of death as a great flood, a very weak bridge made of reeds, is victorious, or his fears are dispersed? He is tamed, unbound, steadfast in mind. So Tanisaro Bhikkhu also uses unbound as uh, Nibbana or Nibbuti. Um, another very powerful verse, very uh, on the topic of aging and death, which was you know, I don't I don't speak much about dependent origination here because I would speak more about it. I think on retreat with more advanced, you know, uh, there's I think there's a time and a place to talk about the the more advanced parts of the practice because I mean the the reason why the Buddha, uh, well, Prince Siddhartha, left his house and like his renunciation is because of what we call the four m the four heavenly messengers and these four heavenly messengers you'd think like oh these four angels came down from the sky no <laughs> actually these four heavenly messengers were he saw a very ill person on the side of the road very sick and he he wasn't used to that he was used to being in a palace where everything was great and he didn't have to worry about anything then he saw a very old person uh, very uh, having a uh, quite some difficulty and he saw a dead corpse on the side of the road that's the third one and then he saw an ascetic wanderer who seemed quite happy and content with living with nothing and uh, so that was huge shock for him <laughs> and the, the, those are what we call the heavenly messenger messengers and so uh, s aging sickness and death those are very central to the Buddhist awakening actually uh, otherwise the Buddha wouldn't have had this sang sangwega that we call the sense of urgency being pushed onward to be like okay like and his chariot matali his charioteer who's saying yes good uh, good prince this is uh, this is a dead body and it's like oh but what what is it doing there it's like what am i are we gonna all be like this it's like yes we're all gonna die someday <laughs> it's like oh <laughs> I was like I'm sure he knew <laughs> like how could he not but but you know that's why um, somebody uh, was reading the Sri Lankan guide to uh, monasteries forest monasteries lately and was pointing out to me oh it's interesting the the mortuary uh, 
clinic or whatever that's called i don't know i don't know how it's called in english but the the place where they do aut autopsies and things like that is like actually written in the guide to <laughs> the guide to forest monasteries in Sri Lanka <laughs> but that's just because it's 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 just really a part of 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 monks practice is contemplation of death that you know that it's actually going to come and that's it's you'd be surprised how uh, efficacious it is to abate pride <laughs> of of this body of you know and to shut out a lot of you know I, I really don't recommend that to everybody but I mean I, I'm a bit on the topic of <laughs> of that a little bit because it's talking about who scatters the troops of the king of death because the Buddha like the Buddha said you know whatever you're gonna do you're you're never gonna escape death like we're all ge we're all going there like as soon as we're born that's that's what is that's dependent origination actually that's that's the, the beginning the end of it he says uh, wherever cleft in the mountain he can find wherever you want to go he leaves a raft in the middle of the ocean you're not gonna escape from death that's a reality that's just around the corner and um, and that's also I think it's important I, I just want to talk a little bit about it now because well first it's mentioned but also it's it's really profound we, we sometimes we take the Buddhist teaching as you know because I, I talk a lot about it about you know developing wholesome mental states and things like that because it's very accessible and th that's what it is that's what it is but sometimes i don't speak a lot of you know the ultimate thing <laughs> where it, where it came from and where you know wh when we talk about the deathless you know like amata the undying it's because th that's that's really central to the buddha's teaching you know when people the arahants describe that they've they've seen the deathless they've entered and plunged into the deathless well that means because because there's no more renewal of being for them there's no there's no more self identity there's no more any unwholesome states that could arise from that because that's the end of unwholesome states altogether is the end of selfhood <laughs> understanding that these are qualities that are developed in body and mind, but body and mind are fully conditioned. And at some point, we train, we train, we train, and at some point, it, it becomes very, very clear that um, there are just sankharas, sa sankharas arising. So that's we 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 train for the wholesome because it's liberating and it's uplifting and it's uh is the path uh and in the end that also brings us closer and closer and closer to have fully clear liberated mind which is cannot associate with a self or a s sense of person And this is quite a profound statement, you know, of a uh, of final awakening where it's this scattering the troops of death like a great flood would just crush a tiny bridge of made of reeds. You know, it's this, this very strong determination of, you know, the, but it's not like a, it's not like a, It's not like lifting weight kind of determination, but really, you know, like that's so much dedication to like, you know, like some some other times they like crush, like crush the army of like the or crush the, the king of death, you know, <laughs> like it crush death itself. It's like whoa, <laughs> okay, <laughs> like 
this is pretty intense stuff <laughs> so yeah and and sometimes we can because i don't speak about it very much but i think now is a good time to say that yes the buddha speaks the way out of death <laughs> he teaches the way to the deathless and his teaching is very unique and very special so we uh uh this this verse is quite uh is touching about that and it's touching on it so and another theme that seems to be coming up also again quite a bit is fear so when someone who someone who's who's made an end of defilements of the mind fear is one of them so and that's a tr that's a tricky one because fear is in our society we we say that fear is like this also it's a defense mechanism but actually yes and no <laughs> there's um there's different kinds of fear i guess but um a lot of unwholesome states are also based on fear. They're, they also rest uh, on it. That's, it's a source. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, uh, but then I would be a very hungry monk. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Well, we're we're pretty good at that. We're definitely. But I, you know, I. I were you gonna say? I have to say that it's kind of ingrained also in 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 the psyche here because even the, because I even me, you know, I I know that I used to say like, oh yeah, we just like put our old people into like these residences and you know like we don't really care about them, but actually that's a lot of them that's also that might be a bit of a gross generality but i know f f for a fact for me that i've seen people that actually want to be there so also it's kind of like elderly people that are that want to 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 go to to these residences so um but yeah, uh, um, in the West, we don't, like in India, there it's much more family oriented. Yeah, so, it's family so oriented. yes, what yes, so exactly. Yes. But we're we're pretty good at uh following our sense desires and in the west. I I mean this is a generality of course, but it's a bit like the Deva plains here. <laughs> it's the human Deva plains of uh 
we have it really good, but there's some things that sometimes we just don't get to see. That's why that's why the Buddhas don't appear in the Deva planes. They they go in the human <laughs> world <laughs> because there's an there's that balance of you know when there's when it's too easy you're not you're not likely to be able to uh, see the Dharma because you're just not gonna be interested. You just like when when you have everything you, when you have unlimited ice cream, what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> that's just a really bad <laughs> like, but and of course you know you don't you don't want to make a gross generality out of that like some people they do have good karma they have good conditions and they use these good conditions with their good karma and wisdom to make even better karma and that's that is a fact that you can see that and that's true but what is also true is that's not the m what's happening in the majority of the case, and so there is there is some quite there is some goodness, you know, just to be born technically in Buddhism, just to be born in the Western culture, like it's very it's very wealthy, it's very there's you know really good social equity. Well, I mean, as far as as far as we can get, you know, or still samsara but we we have it pretty good here you know like uh, s social especially in canada i guess but um social nets and uh, um equality and yes The thing is, when when these emotions stronger, um, start to be felt in body, that means they're already they've already gained quite a lot of momentum. They're they're quite already strong. So that now they're embodied. Yes, it's because all of it is taking it personal, and um, this is quite innate in us. This is quite, this is kind of programmed. We've been programmed like that. We've been programming ourselves like that. So that fear is. Um, just like all the unwholesome states is based on me it's based on me so it's not actually really realistic about the situation itself it's just there is the situation arises and then that will trigger whatever Sankara is connected to that that will trigger whatever bhava whatever habitual tendency that is connected to that very particular um, situation the uh, the more we practice the meditation and settle the mind and make it very steady maybe I think that's maybe that's using your pattern maybe that's how this could happen where it's either you can develop you can develop tranquility and then understanding or then insight kind of thing like meditation jhana and then then that will be the ground for understanding to arise there's no there's no choice i mean when the mind is very calm and very still whatever arises will be seen 
there's a chance that it will be seen at least that's the very first step you know that's why the four noble truths are so important i mean you have to see it first and that's why we train like that we train always to know this is there is dukkha arising for example there is dukkha and the thing is depending on how early or how deep your insight can go through seeing that that fear then when it manifests in the body is the same work is the same is is dukkha it's dukkha it's definitely dukkha when fear arises it's not it's not pleasant and then then you see it you feel that and you know the origin of dukkha is that you're is you have an opinion about something that you can't let go that you have you have a holding on i mean of course it's craving but <laughs> i'm putting it in other words it's not like craving in that sense it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense it's actually you have a judgment you have a holding on you have an attachment you have a something that is impossible to let go at that moment and that is creating all the tension the incapacity to be free of dukkha and the more we train to see that then the more we will be able we will be empowered to let go that's the profound strength of the four understandings of the aryas the four noble truths now body can be used when it's course back into body whatever it is seeing the tension seeing it as is dukkha tension and trying to let it go let go of all we're trying to let go of the cause and the cause is always rooted in me and mine this is just now it depends it depends on what actually is arising for you for me for example i was at a monastery and i was going up at 4 30 in the morning there was wild boars and uh, it's pitch black it's super early in the morning i can't see much and i know there's wild boars running around and I hear the, these like <laughs> in the forest, <laughs> and I'm just like, ooh, <laughs> okay, I'm scared, or just a little bit, you know, just like I'm not like losing my head scared, but I I get this feeling of like, oh, and to me it was very interesting where I could actually see. there's this experience that is arising where there's wild boars okay that's I hear it at the ear base from sound there's contact then there's a reaction there is aversion and there is dislike and there is fear because I think I might get hurt or I might come to pain or something like that now the thing is the fear is optional the fear is not going to change the situation truth is the truth what's happening is happening is that you can't change then 
maybe my my story of the wild boars is not very good because it's <laughs> it's like a survival kind of thing and this it's more like that's a bit more deeply rooted i guess or uh, as very last kind of yes Yeah, but you have to be. You need. Mm -hmm. We have to. We have to be careful about these new, new therapies and things like that. I'm not. Sh I'm not saying that it's all wrong, but it's also all really conditioned, and it really depends on you. It really depends on the the predispositions you know this is all karma the buddha the buddha says it it's all mental conditioning whether it's good or not so we all have different predispositions slightly different now i'm the thing is when when you give in too much on the ground of these are just these are natural impulses there are you know uh, actually you're giving up your power to change all of it then then you won't be able to change because you think that it's supposed to be like that oh yes yes Yes. Well, we try. Yes. We try, we develop the mind as much as we can towards this. But you know the interesting fact, and actually this is what something that per <laughs> personally <laughs> gives, gives me strength to think about, is that actually, you know what, a few minutes right before his awakening, the Buddha was about to awaken fully. Mara didn't like that. <laughs> and so Mara went all in. And if you know the story of the Buddha's awakening and Mara, you know that actually the, the Buddha's awakening, first of all, it didn't happen in just like one snap of the fingers. It was a series of, it was a series of consecutive understandings and, you know, that brought him there. And at the end, he, Mara could, could, could see that the Buddha was just, Prince Siddhartha was just on the verge of <laughs> flipping the switch <laughs> of, of, of realizing. And so he, like this, this, the texts say that right before his awakening, uh, all these shapes, like hor horrific shapes, appeared to the Buddha, to, to Prince Siddhartha, to anything to pull, pull him out, like these really scary visions of all like the <laughs> ugliest things you could imagine and this like his, his army, like his troop just appearing before him and just like charging at him and these lightning flashes and these fireballs and these, the, all these things like he went all in to scare the Buddha and he even sent his daughters <laughs> um, his three daughters uh, I think yes well it's painted on many walls <laughs> yes it's a very popular story uh, Raga, Arati, and I think it's 
uh, dosa probably uh, with Mara's three daughters anger discontent <laughs> and uh, uh, passion or whatever craving and so uh, and they tried everything like they they are like oh like uh, men have all kinds of tastes and so they all transform themselves and like they like young like beautiful looking women and then middle-aged and then older ladies they were like oh maybe he likes older ladies and then you know so it's all these things like at the end of like the buddha's awakening was actually at the end it was pretty intense <laughs> like he, and i think to me that's that's okay we have two choices we don't know like i i wasn't there i don't know i don't know what really happened okay but i think i think that's also can be interpreted as a simile for hindrances all these deepest hindrances arising and just like surfacing and being being released on the spot being he was he was already too far in to um he was already seeing enough of the truth that when all of these things arise arose and he said i see you mara and he just they just all passed by him and he just broke through so to me i think it's actually you know when the stories of uh, the great disciples practicing for awakening they all usually they had a time when they were striving for awakening where they decided they committed okay i'm gonna do it you know i'm just gonna like <laughs> make the push <laughs> and for for some they're all different stories for some it was harder for some it was you know uh, like um ma mogalana bante he said because Sariputta and him, they were talking about how they awoke. And uh, Mahamogala and uh, asked Sariputta, he said, oh, wh how did you, wh how was your training? He said, oh, it was the quick, happy training with quick result. <laughs> and Mahamogala and I said, well, I had, I, well, mine was, mine was the painful, painful way, but with quick result too. So, <laughs> and so they have, um, and often, you know, M Maha Mogalana, he, he was actually, he was full of hindrances. He was, he was drowsy. He couldn't, because, I mean, like you, you basically give up sleep a lot. You, you constantly, you, like they would constantly, like, be aware. Never an unmindful moment. And that's not, that doesn't mean, like, forcing awareness, but it, means like you have to be wholly dedicated to this you know like you can't just that's why it's so hard that's why monks like it's, it's we the practice is different we we're supposed to you know take it a little bit further and uh mahamogalana he's like drowning uh, drowsy <laughs> drowsy and like nodding his head is nodding and the buddha appears in front of him he's like mahamogalana <laughs> he's like mogalana don't be heedless <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like, <laughs> you know, like the Buddha is just like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> there's a whole uh, Samyutta on him, on his awakening, Mogalana, in the Samyutta Nikaya. Each jhana, because Sariputta has a, a, a Samyutta also to himself, how he awoke, each jhana. Um, or, oh no, maybe it's not uh, how he awoke, but uh, Mahamogana, that's, that's his story. And uh, he says, if, uh, if it would be said of anyone rightly that it is because of the teacher that they broke through to awakening, he says, that would be me. Because the Buddha kept appearing in front of him, each jhana, he said, don't be heedless, Mogalana. Like settle your mind in the first jhana, settle your mind, and you know, like uh, uh, continue, continue, and 
second jhana same thing <laughs> third so it was hard you know they had hindrances they were not perfect from the beginning they're not like um but there was a time and when when they the story usually goes like something like this along those lines where they would have these hindrances arising and uh these deepest you know because it's one thing to practice samatha to a certain level and like trying to s keep it floored there or something you know like uh, during a retreat but then it's another to completely surrender to completely like take the next next step forego sleep and uh really being completely uh like when the Buddha says, like, ending the defilements, like, cut them off at the root, he made like a palm stump. Like, it's true. Like, they're, they're not, can just take a second to imbue your mind in this, that, that place where the cleansing of the mind, the purification of the mind that you've done through your practice is so deep that even, like, any kind of sankharas that would have been in the past like an impression of something any unwholesome it's impossible for it to arise the mind is completely clear there's no way that something unwholesome can arise because it's been cut at the root like there's no it's clear so but to go at that level <laughs> it's deep it's deep in the mind so that, that's when that's when the buddha he says he says you should you should pull out pull out the roots of these unwholesome roots you should pull them out extract them out chop them up burn them and winnow the ashes over the river ganges that's what you have to do <laughs> and the way the way you do that is actually yes is that you have to go in that deepest corner you have to go where these you have to train and train the mind it's not easy to to do this kind of mental training at at this level is that's why it's so m meritorious in itself is that uh, it's hard <laughs> m most people um um it requires a, a level of of commitment and de dedication that is quite extraordinary so uh I, and I say that in in a way that I'm not bypassing the the gradual training, <laughs> you know, like not at all. Actually, it's all part of that, but it's all you know pushed to an another. So when when we're talking about these deep unconscious kind of primal instincts, and that that's why uh, also uh, physical attraction is a big thing too. You know, we're not talking about, you know, th and this would be just anagami, not even full arahantship, you know, like complete, complete disinterest in this sense, any kind of sense, anything. <laughs> it's just not interesting. Mental, mental steadiness and mental collectedness are so strong and so much more blissful for you at that point it would be like taking a very sharp knife like perfectly sharpened and just like blunted on a rock it would be like that it would just it <laughs> for a nanagami it doesn't make any sense <laughs> it would just be like why would i do that <laughs> like <laughs> no <laughs> like <laughs> like the knife is so sharp it's it's like you can do everything with it and it's perfect you know it's 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 meant that's what the knife is meant to do you know it's meant to be that sharp it's the job of the knife the mind is the same thing it's like when you don't try to chop rocks with your knife you know you just actually so 
um, in a way, it's really f seen and felt as very blissful, that release also. I mean, right after there's in the Mahavaga in the Vinaya, there's the the Bodhicatta, the story of awakening of the Buddha, and you know he sits for seven days in one posture, in the bliss of awakening. <laughs> That's just what it said, you know. It says, well, uh, shortly after being uh, fully awake, the the all awakened Buddha was sitting cross-legged in one posture for seven days, enjoying the bliss of freedom. <laughs> <laughs> and he did that under seven different trees for seven weeks, seven days. Just to tell you, like, that's pretty good. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah, however, I don't know. I never take, you know, these stories at full cash, but I do kind of pick up a sense of that that's probably pretty close to what happened you know <laughs> but yes yeah, some people would say that he went for like almost a month and a half without eating and uh just kept yeah so that which you know right there is a bit contradictory to his middle path <laughs> but <laughs> who knows who knows exactly what happened but i think it's quite uplifting i don't i don't think i would try <laughs> going for a month and a half without eating and <laughs> trying to experience any kind of bliss <laughs> I think that would probably be very hard I tried once to just sit in the lotus posture and blew my knee <laughs> so <laughs> it was totally pointless <laughs> couldn't sit for for a month like I could sit but I had to n I couldn't sit in cross-legged posture for a long time because I just blew my knee and because I just I just you know that's another time where that also was part of my path I guess where I understood that not all meditation techniques will bring you there will bring you to the right place uh, in a sense that I was trying a lot of different things and I was like well it sounds pretty intense you know what <laughs> like the awakening sounds pretty intense so maybe i should like really try hard you know <laughs> and like i'll just fold my legs and lot of pose and i have big calves too so i have to crank them up really high so <laughs> like my knees were really like <laughs> and um, i tried i just really hurt myself real bad and i learned a lot i learned a lot of i guess you could call wisdom afterwards where I saw that, yeah, that's not the way to awakening, actually. That's just pointless. And I was like, I don't feel any more enlightened, you know? <laughs> I feel just like I actually feel stupid. <laughs> and that's how I felt. I was like, and I felt like I couldn't do it. I felt incapable because I was like, wow, this is so out of reach for me, you know? But I just didn't know. I just didn't know anything about what the Buddhist teaching actually was. That was way before. That was before I encountered the Dhammapada, which was al already a few years ago. And um, I was reading, actually, I was reading the Bhagavad Gita at that time, even. And um, And it's through that, and also other other things where where I, I pushed certain uh, meditations to a point where there was so much pain for l very little gain. It's almost like training. It's like training meditation. <laughs> yes. Well, it was. Well, <laughs> for for a lot of people, uh, it is like so, some people are very extreme about it. But the thing, what when I was I started reading the suttas and I was like it doesn't make sense you know it doesn't add up at all I'm reading these things you know the Buddha is talking about like suffusing your whole body like immersed drenched permeated pervaded suffused with the joyful happiness born of I'm like what <laughs> it's like who experiences that and I'm like and then they they would tell me like oh no like 
don't don't go that way and then i was like but why would the buddha say that like why would the buddha talk about this and you're telling me the opposite you're telling me i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go into that but so slowly slowly personally i started realizing well there's major discrepancies between what i'm being taught and what i'm actually reading that the buddha is supposed to have said i mean this this is these are called the discourses of the buddha I don't know. and these are called buddhist meditations like <laughs> and, and it didn't add up or one of the things i couldn't find was like i was doing anapanasati a lot like the unmindfulness of breathing i i, I looked here for a long time and, and that was like my favorite thing back then but I couldn't, I couldn't find where is that place in the suttas where the Buddha says that. And I still can't find it. The closest word I can find is parimukha, which means in front of or facing one or in front of someone. Mukha is like face, but it means also in front or parimukha would be like before one. That's the only place, you, the only word, really, you can find that. But really, that's just not... Uh, and some, uh, some meditations that... Uh, after days in retreat, I was just feeling everything that uh, I was d doing everything that I was told to do and uh, <laughs> many retreats in a row and then like wait like at the beginning it was a, b a big change like the first one was like whoa okay like I can actually focus my mind or something you know like that was like totally new to me <laughs> and like the virtues and things like that and that was a massive thing but then then it felt like it stopped there it felt like okay like how 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 does it go further and how what is behind all this you know i'm and, and then reading the suttas was very helpful in figuring out that oh wait a minute there's something wrong here like i'm reading something in these texts that like, can somebody explain to me, like, what's going on here? Because I really don't get... And I couldn't find anybody to explain to me that these... That, oh, yeah, this is why, and this... Then what is given as as the, the reason is, oh, it's part of a commentary, and it's part of, you know, this and that. And you just really have to know it, and you all basically you have to be a monk almost to like know all these things where and then i met a teacher who could explain that to me who could explain uh a lot of these things basically all my questions boom 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 one after the other which i had asked to top sayadaws of burma and abbots of monasteries and they answered me oh it's all the commentaries and I was like, well, that just doesn't answer my question at all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like, thank you, but no. It's like, I, I don't, I can't do anything with that. But then, then it was just very, it, that one teacher made it clear on many, many levels. And then, and then the experience was very different. The meditation was very different. And then I was reading the suttas, and then I was understanding what the suttas were saying. Like, the experience matched the Buddha's words, whereas before, I really didn't feel anywhere close to matching <laughs> what the Buddha was saying. <laughs> like, not, not, even, not even close. So... Um, for me, sometimes I just remember how how I used to practice, and uh, and now, and it's so amazing. 
like that just that is a happy recollection for me <laughs> and it's the buddha says it you can do that you can remember what you used to do or what you used to be in the past and remember like look at now and joy arises right away <laughs> and you're like for me it's true <laughs> it's like whoa yeah and the, for me it's still like a, a gift i cannot repay ever 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 like is to being just the being able to have an experience of meditation that matches the the buddha's discourses and and then the proximity with the buddha is so much stronger you know you feel like you're right there with him because his teaching what he's saying works and that's just amazing you know it's like whoa <laughs> okay like and and then you realize how much the buddha knew and how how his wisdom was so very profound and again, this is testified by the elders. I'm just going to read a few more, I guess, just to leave on a good note. This is Pelinda Wacha. Pirinda Wacha has a bit of a story to himself in the Vinaya, but now I'm, I'm getting, uh, I'm stretching it for you today. So, <laughs> um, It has come, it has not departed, nor was that bad advice to me. Among the things shared out, I obtained the best. And this is also quite quite a wonderful reflection it has come the teaching and the state of mind that comes after full development in following that teaching that path it has not departed our hardship when it's locked in completely that's how I interpret this anyways what he's saying it has come the teaching he's practiced it it has not departed now. He's practiced it until the place where it's it's not going, it's not coming back to defilements again. It was not bad advice to me. That was for his own welfare. The Buddha said that out of compassion, his teaching. Now he's seeing it. <laughs> now he's witnessing it. First row. Among the things shared out, I obtained the best. And that's his testimony. Of yes, <laughs> it's true. I think that's very powerful. Whoever, a master of knowing, contented, restrained in mind, destroys longing for here and beyond, unsmeared with regard to all dhammas or mental states, would know the arising and disbanding of the world, arising and passing away. This is uh, Punamasa. In the PTS it says, He has destroyed longing for this world or the next. Who has attained to knowledge is quiet and self-controlled, not clinging to all phenomena. He will know the arising and passing away of the world. And just so, just so you know, the world, every time the Buddha says the world, he's only talking about the six senses. Like he's not talking about, because that's another problematic point in the Western mind. Sometimes we don't we don't know what he's talking about. Like the, we think, like the world, but really in other suttas he makes that clear. What he means, the world is only the six senses. So when he uses that word, that's what he means. So the arising and passing 
the six senses all the time. A bhikkhu who has much joy in the doctrine taught by the Buddha would attain to the peaceful state, the happy calming of the constituent elements of sankhara. So that's that's a different translation, but um, a bhikkhu who has much joy in the doctrine taught by the Buddha would attain to the peaceful state, the happy calming of all activities, mental activities. Those are the, all the sankharas. Sabba sankara samato. That's what that means. That's another way of describing uh, the undescribable. <laughs> the that calming of all mental activities till there's n no more. That's the um, description of stuck description of nibbana. Etang santang, this is peaceful. Etang panidang, this is blissful. Yadidang sabba sankara samato. That is the complete calming of all mental activities. Sabupadi patinisago, the giving up of all attachments. Tanha kayo, the quenching of quenching the thirst. Uh, viraga, calming down. Nirodo, unbinding or cessation, complete unobstruction. Nibbana, blowing out. Okay, here, yeah, this is a good, this is a good one. Okay, one watcha. The color of blue dark clouds glistening, cooled with waters of clear flowing streams, covered with ladybugs, these rocky crags refresh me. So these an anthem to solitude of these teras. Actually, these, uh, that's what, you know, that, that's what they wanted. That's, <laughs> that's what they were looking for. You know, like a hole in the mountain. <laughs> you know, like just, and that's just beautiful. It's when you, there's, when mind delights in emptiness, these are the places where you feel at ease, you feel like there's nothing c causing any kind of friction on, on these things. My preceptor, and this is, <laughs> so Wanawacha was uh, the, the, the one I just read, and this is Wanawacha's pupil, the, the Samanera of Samu uh, Wanawacha. My preceptor said to me, let's go from here, Sivaka. My body stays in the village, my mind has gone to the wilds. Even though lying down, I go. There's no tying down one who knows. And so here he's just, it's just a natural, comfortable place for the mind that it wants to go. It's just solitude, this forest solitude. And that's another beautiful testimony of of one who knows. You know, there's no tying down one who knows. As one who has seen the state, that's another way they would put it sometime. One who has seen the deathless state, one who has seen the peaceful state. It it leaves an impression and that's why they say what what does the mind lean towards after coming out of cessation, after coming out of Niroda? The mind leans toward release. It inclines towards release. 
So naturally, that's just where the mind goes. Just as a fine thoroughbred steed with swishing tail and mane runs with next to no effort, so my days and nights run with next to no effort now that I've gained a pleasure not of the flesh. Which that's this Niramisa uh, Sukha, Niramisa Piti, so that uh, spiritual bliss that is not worldly and that's a very specific bliss that we talk about when we say joy in the buddhist teaching we don't mean joy like any kind of joy joy we mean niramisa the mental the the one that is born from mental development which is a very unique very very specific type of joy that's not of course of course ha ha being joyful is a good thing <laughs> But when we talk about the mental development and the joy of the bhikkhus or joy of... That's what we're talking about. It's, it's not related to this. It's related to ment freedom. <laughs> Letting go. Okay, not too, not too many more now. I just want to make sure I covered the ones I covered. I wanted to cover spiritual happiness that's what this one says Dasaka. truly truly irrigators lead the water arrow makers bend the arrow straight carpenters work wood men of good vows tame themselves Attacking such a bhikkhu whose mind is like splendor, constantly fruitful, you will come to grief, Kanha. Kanha is another name for Mara. It's the, it's the dark one. <laughs> Kanha means black. Um, and that's another thing that happens with... That's the same as the Dhammapada verse when you throw... Uh, Someone who tr throws insults at a blameless person is like throwing fine dust against the wind. It just comes back on them, <laughs> and that's that's another that's another way of understanding the protection of the Dharma when we when we cultivate these wholesome qualities in us. Um, we're protected, even though we might think sometimes we're not. <laughs> we are. Um, Because in in our in our world, we, you know, it's like often it's competition prevails. You know, it's like uh, the law of the toughest, the law of the, you know, you uh, take what you can get, <laughs> and this it seems sometimes like you. In a survival kind of world, uh, it would be hard for someone who's actually just practicing not hurting any living beings to get by. You know. But actually, it's it's not true. The Dhamma is the protection, in fact, and it's that's why we say be careful, be careful around the good, the the people who practice these things like mental development and things like that, because um, it's good to be mindful of what we, what we what we think. Um, It's like um, it would be maybe like compared to uh, like trying to go against 
the current or something like that. It's like, you know, this is Dharma, this is how things work. If, if, if you're not careful, you know, if you don't want to, like, if you want to fight against that, then it's actually for your own downfall in, in the first place. I'm not saying you, but I mean someone else. Uh, it's um, it's just how things are, anyhow. Okay, couple, couple, and couple more, and then we. There's just too many good ones. <laughs> Okay, this is 21, and he has uh, 21. I'm not afraid of danger, of fear. Our teachers skilled in the deathless, where danger, where fear do not remain. That's the path by which the monks go. <laughs> the teacher is skilled in the deathless <laughs> and then Supiya 32 he has a good one too I'll make a trade aging for the ageless burning for the unbound the highest peace, the unexcelled rest from the yoke. Yoga came up. This is the word we were talking about the other day. The rest from exertion, something like that. I can't remember. And this is uh, 32. PTS says, I shall exchange the aging for agelessness, the burning for quenching, for the highest peace, for unsurpassed rest from exertion. And this is, technically this is what the Buddha taught, yoga kema, exertion. Yoga means also exertion or binding, uh, being, it's, it's actually cl very close to being fettered, yoga. Um, well, actually, that's <laughs> that's what it means, <laughs> yoked. And so uh, the Buddha kema is safety, freedom, um, security. So it's safety from or. Uh, um, a shelter or uh, you know came as a refuge or safety from from being fettered so that's where the buddha's teaching goes <laughs> so on this i hope you're as inspired as i am <laughs> and so uh, let's share our merits and maybe i'll let you go Dukkha patta chani dukkha bhaya patta chani bhaya Sukha patta chani sukha hantu sabbe ti panino Idang no punyang sabbe satta nimurantu Sabba sampatti siddhiya Aga satta jabu matta Devanaga mahidukkha punyang tang anumuritva May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sigh.